Tell little Jim. You're doing yeah. okay. Hello. Um, my name is Esther McCarthy, and I'm very proud and delighted to welcome the film supervisor director, John Butler. And, uh, Hello. Sorry to show you Can you warm up and please? Follow-up, of course, to your debut film, The Stag, and a lot of common themes, I think, mm. in the movie. Yeah. Um, particularly uh, the idea of male friendship and that, mm. ma uh, you know, even though a friendship is so powerful and they're so reliant on each other that they're afraid to talk about their feelings. Yeah. Is that something that you want to explore in your films? Yeah, well, clearly, I, uh, unconsciously, I guess, yes. Men and their nonsense. Um, <laughs> and I include myself in that as a man. Uh, but yeah, I think that's uh, it. Just keeps coming up over and over again. I think uh, the value of male friendship between men very often is the fact that they don't talk about things, and that preserves a kind of sacred space between them where they can feel comfortable. You know, and that's an interesting paradox that I think is just fun to push around. And stories of friendship interest me. Uh, I think the dominant narrative of cinema is obviously boy meets girl, and the romantic uh, plot of films. You know, and in a film like this, when you present a story of two characters meeting, regardless of their gender or orientation, there is a kind of weight of expectation on the audience that they'll hook up, you know, because that's what we're fed more often than not by way of a storyline in, in films that feel good, you know, particularly in the in the comedy space, which this one is. So it's always enjoyable to um, resist that, I suppose, and to just honour the idea that you can be friends with somebody and that that relationship can have as much weight or as much meaning as a romantic storyline. Um, I love, just the viewer in me loves buddy movies and uh, loves that whole subgenre. Um, but also I, I love my friends and, and that relationship to me uh, with my friends has been the dominant one of my adult life. So it's really mm. enjoyable for me to write in that area. I just, uh, you know, maybe I'll write a r more romantic film at a, at a certain point down the line, but I do enjoy male friendship and uh, madness of it and the ways in which we are bananas and unable to relate to each other and, you know. Well we'll take the bromance in the meantime before we get to the romance. But, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, to, to what extent is this, uh, I know you've talked in a lot of interviews recently about writing from a place of truth in, in, in your own personal experiences, but to what extent is this autobiographical and to, you know to what extent do you need to make the move from your, your personal story to fiction? It's 46 percent. Okay. <laughs> I didn't need no. an exact figure. <laughs> uh, no, I'm 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 pretty much uh, I, I'm fifty percent Ned and fifty percent Connor. I would say so. It's drawn heavily from my own childhood, but the facts I was I would say or the plot of the film is not mine. Uh, but certainly the two lead characters and their emotional uh, states of being are mine. Uh, mm. I was a deeply pretentious. Um, <laughs> fan of music who thought he was a complete outsider as a kid um, and I'm also gay and I'm also really into sport and I found it very hard to kind of embody all those things in one person as a young man and that's really kind of a, that was the kind of struggle of my young life was to try and find a way to stop looking for role models who did it for me and to try and do it myself so yeah the, the, the um, that journey was fun to kind of then separate the two parts of me into two characters and then watch them drift together again in the course of writing it. And that mm. was the, the tension, you know, uh, it, it felt uh, cathartic in a way. But I, I think all good, I'm not talking about memoir necessarily or autobiography, but I think the idea of writing from a place of emotional truth and connection is really important, uh, especially in comedy, because I think comedy film can fly away with uh, jokes if it isn't rooted in, in something that has something, you know, resonant or maybe something to say. and I seem to uh, certainly want to try and you know make these stories land in, in some way in addition to being funny and, and uh, so that was the impulse with this for sure. Mm. Can we talk about uh, the first time I saw it at, at Adif back in February uh, it, I thought it raised a really interesting in, in a very subtle way a very interesting debate about sexuality in sport mm. and that's a very interesting area isn't it because I don't think is there a premiership footballer who's out no. for example? No, and there's um, not a rugby union professional at the highest level either, and those that have come out have done so either at the end of their careers or, in the case of the soccer players, it's when they play for the MLS or you know when they leave the Premiership. And it suggests to me that this this is a choice, the choice that I refer to in my own terms of that between being gay and, and being interested in sport, is still a choice that people feel they have to make or is being imposed upon people. Um, and just I I I 
question that binary uh, definition, if not re reject it outright. I just don't understand whether that's, you know, I can accept that maybe no, there is no premiership soccer player that's, that's gay possibly, but then why isn't there is the bigger and more pressing question? And I think that then makes you ask the question about our education system, not just in this country, but generally, like, mm -hmm. how are these people being prevented from realizing that aspect of themselves? Because that's clearly what's happening. And, you know, it just seems to me that it's important to um, to tear down some of those really rigid, uh, you know, structures and definitions. They're just not helpful for anybody, you know. And the most important thing is to just claim your own identity, wh whatever that might be. Um, that all said, I think the best um, form for telling any of those stories or m making any of those of those points is, is comedy, because the world is bananas and ridiculous, and you know that's the kind of lens you need to put on it. I feel. Mm. But yeah, sports, it's, it's interesting. I think individual athletes um, <coughs> across dis different disciplines are able to come out and, and you know, to their great credit, I, I would say it's never easy, but um, I just think the more kind of quote unquote masculine sports, team sports like um, soccer and rugby union, it really feels to me like it's years overdue. And I just, I think of my young self and I think of what the effect of, of, a, of, a, of an event like that would have been to me, and, and I'm not joking when I say it would have been, like on a personal level, it would have been absolutely seismic, because it would have given me permission to maybe be braver, and you know, that's obviously that's saying something about my inability to do it myself when I was young, but mm. that aside, kids are kids, and I just think there is a huge responsibility on adult people, just generally speaking, to go and claim that. Can I introduce Fionn here and can I congratulate you on a remarkable performance? Thank really, you. very <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Um, when did you, uh, what did you see on the page in, on John's script at the very early stages that drew you to, to take on this part? Um, well, I, I could just completely relate to it and, and relate it back to my time in school. Um, and it's, oh God, it's such an actory thing to say that when you read something, you just got it. But it, it was kind of, a, the first time that it happened to me, and um, yeah, so from the moment I, I read it, I, I knew I wanted to be involved, and then thankfully John was, was happy to have me. Well, he was just, in, like he did a tape, which is the way of the world for young actors these days, they record yeah. themselves on iPhones and email the thing over, and it was sent to us uh, by an agent, and it was immediately apparent he was just, he had that perfect blend of, of confidence and vulnerability. Uh, that, that, it, that the space between those two things is where the entire joke of Ned's existence lives and he understands that so well. So. Yeah. No, sorry, and, go and, ahead. And on the note of, uh, of taping, um, yeah, every, everything kind of, you, you film an audition on your, on your iPhone. And I was only talking about this the other day that, like, I, so I was filming this in an iPhone hotel room in, in South Africa, and there's only so many times where you can shave Connor Masters as gay, like, over and over and over, <laughs> creating phone calls, being like, "Is everything okay?" <laughs> or like, "Yeah, we know." Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, so, yeah. Do, do yeah, we got it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm guessing that's uh, when you were in South Africa. You're probably too modest to say what you were in Jada film, which is a uh, second great performance mm -hmm. in the movie this year. Were you, were you down there filming that at the time? Uh, yeah, so I was, I was filming Jada film uh, there, and that's how the whole thing kind of came about. It was uh, uh, Jason O'Mara who. Um, is also in the films, very good friends with John, and um, John said he was looking for, for someone to play this part, and do you have any recommendations? And uh, so yeah, so that, that's how I found out about it, and went on tape. Um, I, th I think we should give a little nod as well, and I know Nicholas um, Galitzine, I got it right, did yeah, I? Yeah, no. uh, is, is not here this evening, but mm -hmm. it's an extraordinary performance. I know there's been a bit of talk about the accent, but he really nailed that Dublin accent, didn't he? Yeah. He's from Putney. Um, so. <laughs> I just love saying he's from Putney. It's just, <laughs> just the Putney-ness of it. Um, but yeah, he, he put himself on tape through Curtis Brown in London, his agents, and I got the tape and I c called him up and, and through Rob and Rebecca, the producers, and I was like, there's this amazing Irish actor working in London who's done an unbelievable tape for us. You know, and that shows you how convincing he was. He had that, mm -hmm. he had that accent on rock. Um, but it transpires he's been doing Irish accents for his whole life as a joke for his family. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> I with him last it's, week it's and he likes It's very funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he's great. Nick is wonderful and you know he um, he's he understands the whole 
holding the camera idea and you know the, the silence of that character is a real trick I think um, mm. there's a lot of discipline involved and a lot of restraint and you know a lot of acting with the eyes and, and he's so good at that um, and he's a beautiful singer and guitar player uh, but we cast him uh, without even assuming that he might know how to hold a rugby ball and, uh, and it was only as we were going to prep that Rob Walpole the producer was like let's just call his agents and see like maybe you never know he might have played a bit of you know basketball or whatever in his childhood and it transpired that he plays for the Harlequins Academy in London as an out half so <laughs> like we just lucked out on a, yeah. a number of levels because we thought we would have to double all that action and he only got into acting because he suffered a serious injury is that right yeah let's not feel sorry for him on yeah. any level though um John, can we talk a little bit about the experience of filming because you know a, a young new cast uh, you know a sense of vibrancy to the film uh, I think we've had a lot of coming of age movies with, with young casts this year we seem to be having a bit of a moment in that regard with like the young offenders and a date for mad mary is it exciting as a young actor to be a part of that um, experience yeah absolutely and i think it says a lot about the young talent that we have in in ireland um you know uh, all the lads mark mark and, and jamie are here and rory maybe as well um you know, uh, and uh, and Jay, um, you know, it, it's kind of credit to I don't know whatever they're teaching people in Ireland. This, uh, yeah, we have we have kind of really good young talent. And in terms of making it, um, it was such a nice experience. I was pretty nervous going in just because I'd read the script and you do the audition and you get the part and you're like, oh, this is amazing. And then you go, well, what if I mess it all up? Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't want to do that and John didn't want me to mess it up even more. It's really cool that you didn't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, was, uh, but yeah, no, it was it was great. And um, I, I felt in safe hands though because um, Rob and Rebecca at, at Treasure bring together such a nice group of people mm -hmm. uh, who really care about what they're doing. Um, so yeah, no, I felt in, in very safe hands. You know, I've been lucky enough to be on a Treasure film set and there's always a great atmosphere on set. It's great. Yeah, we had, a, we had a, a, an unused building uh, that was attached to the school that we filmed and then the production offices were based there and wardrobe and props and every department was in there. And, you know, it was a, the end of the summer, whatever that year was, 105 years ago. And uh, in between setups and at lunchtime, you'd see like people from the cast out playing football and stuff. And, you know, it's so nice to see that like a company feel being engendered. I think it's really important, especially if you're a young actor, because you haven't been on <coughs> hundreds of sets before. So, you know, you, you're looking around you and taking cues about how to behave, and it's just nice to feel that um, that atmosphere is being fostered. I think it comes out on screen. Mm. I think it's really helpful for comedy mm. that people feel safe and free to, to do that stuff. I never really bought that idea of tension as a as an important kind of um, you call it like a kind of a that, that, that friction creates a spark that is in some way valuable in film mm. i think the the quality you get from letting people feel warm is 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 really appreciable you know mm. yeah. what's it like though fion when you think you've nailed the a few rugby moves and you're just about getting it right and then brian o'driscoll arrives on set um is that a bit stressful yeah well i suppose i, I kind of was lucky enough that i wasn't embarrassed in front of brian o'driscoll um, and <laughs> yeah. I was embarrassed singing a song, but uh, that was kind of the height of it. Um, yeah, I was surprised when you said Nick was a great singer and guitar player. You didn't mention me in that. Uh, no, I didn't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't um, mention you at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, go on. Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Please continue. Um, yeah, so I, 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 uh, I actually didn't even know that he was doing the rugby coordination because they were going to do the training and they're like, oh, we're all going to UCD. To do you want to come along? And I didn't really want to watch them play rugby for you know a couple of hours and then the whatsapp group got flooded with pictures of like all of them with brian o'driscoll and um, and i had no idea that was happening so yeah i did feel i, I felt really left out though and they were running all the, i really wanted to i played rugby when i was younger so um i think yeah. it's really important that you felt left out for your character <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was john manipulating that rugby yeah Absolutely. that's, yeah, that's yeah. it exactly the old, yeah. the old puppet master <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone got any questions? Hello, hello. You know, I thought that the film had a really powerful message. I think it's the best Irish film I've seen for years. And also, also I think the message of the film, while it was, you say, it's essentially gay, I think it says something about all people who feel outsiders in some way. And I thought that was the best thing about it Thank as well. You. 
it was, had a global message for everybody. Well, thank you very much. It's so nice to hear. It. I, I, it's interesting, um, and everybody's interpretation is important with any film, you know, because it's it's a this is a two way experience. They're you know they're made for audiences to understand and to interpret. For me, the interesting thing is that Ned's uh, sexuality is never defined, and that's really important to me because you can interpret it as a story of friendship between two characters who aren't straight, or one who isn't straight and one who's an ally, or ultimately, which is the most important thing of all, two lonely human beings who want a friend. And so I would agree with you entirely, um, it ought to transcend the notions of identity and sexuality and just really be about uh, friendship, because that's the, the core of any buddy movie. And I, 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 I'm really glad to hear you say that because it's really important to me that films that have LGBT characters in them <coughs> aren't ghettoized necessarily as kind of gay it, films. It well, yeah, I mean, film film doesn't have a sexual orientation. A film can't be sexually attracted to another film, <laughs> to the best of my knowledge. So, um, and while I'm hugely proud to be gay, and that's a very important part of my identity, I think it's really important that the the orientation of characters in a in a in a, in a feature film doesn't um, marginalise the film itself. So I'm really glad you were able to just find it a, a buddy movie on its own terms. So thanks. Any other questions from the audience? This I guess it's very related, but um, like as an actor going into playing that role, were you given notes so that you, were you like told your character is gay or straight or neither? Like was that completely like, when, when did you create a headcanon for the character in which they were one or the other or kept it completely irrelevant? Um, no, it was it was that like like John's saying, you know, Ned um, is just a really lonely guy, and it doesn't really matter if if he is gay or if he's straight. What he needs is a, is a, is a friend. Um, so we well, I mean we didn't really discuss Ned's sexuality. No, I mean I, I love that about the character. Like I love mm. that as a viewer, I viewed it as as not specific. I was just curious, like from an acting perspective, sometimes I feel like you have to like know your character or something. So I don't know if you had to do something. <laughs> no, yeah, 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 no, you're right. And this is the thing, like people, and that's the really cool thing like you're talking about, is some people leave and go, you know, I, I love that they're both gay and they're just friends. And some go, I love that there's that straight gay alliance at the end. Um, but no, in terms of talking about, I mean, we, talk, we, we, we talked about it, but not, not to, to, to great lengths, really. I think uh, it's a testament to like the, you know, people of Fionn's age in this country that that, doesn't become a, an item on the agenda nearly as much as it would be with an actor of my generation who would immediately wa want to have that defined. I think people of Fionn's age are, are able to be friends with ambiguity in a way that's so admirable, you know, and you can see that in how they live their lives. They're, you know, they do reject a lot of these binary definitions that we're obsessed with, and I think it's to their credit, and I think it's so helpful to people generally if we're kind of loosened from that thing and I think it's interesting I love your question because I would as an actor yeah as much information as you can get is going to help you but the true core of it is that if we're all the same ultimately in terms of how our hearts beat then the fact that he's lonely is the most important element you know um, uh, when we premiered, we premiered at Glasgow and a guy came up to me afterwards and uh, and he said uh, I'm gay and I'm just I wanted to thank you for having the two fellas not hook up in the film and I was like all right cool and he said uh, and the reason I want to thank you is because when I was 18 I came out to my best friend and there was a beat and then my best friend went oh I'm actually gay as well and then there was another beat and they looked at each other and they both thought well do we have to hook up now <laughs> do you know what I mean as if it's there's no choice you know and like oh you know I okay, you know my gay friends and I are not you know you can be friends and so uh, the ambiguity of it is really important um, and I'm really thankful to actors like Fionn who don't uh, need to kind of have it spelled out actually it's great it's very uh, uh, very it gives, gives me hope there's <laughs> a gentleman up here at the back has a question hi there um, thanks for showing the film and coming along tonight um, thought it was great and um, my question is, well, basically at the end, I heard the song Go or Go Ahead by Rufus Wainwright. Could not believe it. And I, I don't think anyone's ever used that for an end credit song, but it was perfect. So I just want to know, was it hard to get that song on the soundtrack? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, if I'm allowed to agree with you. I, he's so incredible, and um, I've, I really wanted to use it. and. 
stuck it on. The editor assembled the film for a couple of weeks before I got into the room, and he'd used another song. <coughs> but it was always that song for me. So in the first edit that I showed to the producers, Rob and Rebecca, it was Go or Go Ahead. And, and immediately afterwards, I remember Rob saying to me, OK, so we just, what's, how do we do, OK, let's just get this, you know? And uh, it involved writing a letter to him. And, you know, the, the kind of, the elements beyond the sound of the song itself are important in terms of it's an LGBT voice closing the film. And I thought that was really important for the message to land. But just, he's so wonderful. And it's so operatic and so uh, emotive, you know? So I wrote him a letter and uh, I think he gave it to us for a reasonable amount of money. And I think it's real, you know, kind of credit to, uh, it, it ha happened maybe seven or eight times this film that artists gave it based on the feeling that they got when they saw either a clip of the film that we sent over or maybe an email that I wrote and they responded to the idea, you know, and, and I think it possibly gives them a sense that it, you're just not trying to drop a piece of commercial music on to boost a piece of drama, like you're you're actually thinking about what it all says and how they marry. So, uh, yeah, I was absolutely delighted to get that song. I just think he's uh, he's incredible. So I'm, I'm really pleased it, it worked. Yeah. Anyone has a question? Oh, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to um, the teacher. I mean, it was, oh, Captain, my Captain. Mm -hmm. It was such a, he, he has all of the performances, all of the performances, I don't know if you can even, I, I think I can talk loud. <laughs> Americans, <laughs> Americans talk very loud. We, we have an American, <laughs> American um, in row two. Yeah, yeah. sorry. I, I, I wish I could just say I was Canadian, but I can't. <laughs> um, but anyway, the performances were stellar. It was, it was beautifully written, beautifully yeah. directed, yeah. and um, and and not to, to cheapen it in any way by relating it to um, why am I drawing a blank with Oh Captain, My Captain, Dead, 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 Dead Poets. Poets. Yeah. But um, but it was uh, it was really beautifully done, and uh, and I and I love that there was no qualifier. Mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. that he didn't that there, we didn't know, and we shouldn't know because no. there there we don't need to. We don't need to. So anyway, beautiful job. Thank you. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. The Dead Poets Society thing oh, is a real, is a real, um, was a clear yeah. touchstone for the film in the writing of it, I will say. And uh, that and, you know, John Hughes and mm -hmm. Election, Alexander Payne's film, which has like at least two protagonists as well. So they were all, and, and that whole subgenre of the high school film, which I, inspired me and, and spoke to me as a kid, uh, was foremost in my mind. And the only, um, answer or development or response that I wanted to include in, in, in my film to films from that era was the idea of knowledge being able to flow upwards from the kids to the adults. Um, I think, I'm a I mean, giant fan of Dead Poets Society, but I think the teacher is presented as this kind of impermeable pillar of wisdom where he just gives, imparts the lessons to the kids and they eventually figure it out. But to me, you know, and it's what we spoke about before in terms of emotional intelligence among young people, I think young people are frequently so much more wise than their elders. And in my film, all the elders are bumbling, insecure, and fearful, and on the precipice of doing the wrong thing. And I think the kids have to educate them. And that was just a, a way of, of perhaps kind of moving that idea along slightly. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a giant fan of those films too. And, uh, it was beautiful. And please, please give the, the teacher a, a, a big pat on the back. Oh, well, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will, of course. And you've worked with Andrew, and um, we should mention the wonderful Mo Dunford here as yes. well. But you've uh, you've worked with Andrew in on the stag, obviously. Mm. Uh, was it hard to persuade the A-listers that they were going to be playing second fiddle to um, an unknown cast? No, I I think maybe actually I'm speculating, but I think maybe sometimes that's easier. Yeah. In a way, because it's a a, a film among an ensemble of. of of other good actors, so you can kind of just read the script and understand the merits of it and agree to play a part, mm. like to be a component of a film where there are other important contributing roles. Like the big ones are, you know, Ned and Connor, like what they do is what's going to make the film work mm. or not work. So I think there's probably a freeing aspect in coming along and playing, <coughs> um, you know, the third or fourth or fifth or sixth uh, lead in a film like this because mm. you can go and do your thing and mm. it doesn't live or die on it necessarily. That said, I think Andrew and Mo, you know, those two guys are meant to kind of battle for the souls of the kids. So, you know, if you don't have that real pull towards mm. towards either side of the argument, and if they don't stand up to each other, and if they don't spark up each other and the kids, then yeah, the film is in trouble. So and you need no. great actors to make that work. Oh, you do, absolutely. And you need actors who can be funny and serious at exactly the same time. And 
in Mal and Andrew were just I think masters at that. So yeah, yeah it was a it was a it was a fantastic experience with each of them. Unfortunately, we're we're running out of time. I think I think there's another screening this evening, but can we talk? To cancel it. Right, lock the doors. We're here. Um, can we talk briefly about upcoming projects? Because I know there's uh, there's been a lot of heat around the, the next project that you're doing, um, which is going to be set in America. Is that right? Yeah, it's called Papi Chilo, and it's about the friendship between a weatherman and a Latino migrant worker. It's a kind of odd couple. It, I, I I keep calling it a comedy about loneliness, and then I keep thinking. Maybe that's not possible, but <laughs> which is to say, maybe it won't be quite as comic as this. But it's that's the idea anyway, and uh, I'm hoping to make that towards the end of the year. Um, but uh, it's all up in the air at the moment. Um, before we wrap up, though, um, two at least of the other actors are here, and I'd love to get them to stand up and take a round of applause. Uh, the guys who play Spainer and Wallace, Jamie Hallahan and Mark Lavery, are here for sure. I don't know if Roy's here, but those two are here. Would you guys just stand up and take a little bow because you're unbelievable. Oh, hello. Oh, hello, Louis. I also I want to give a tertiary shout out. Has a rapper ever said tertiary before? Anyway, Rory O'Connor, who plays Weasel, is here, and I think every good high school film has to have a bully. And Rory absolutely nailed it, so I should get a little round of applause as well. So. John, very briefly, you, you're off working with Kieran Knightley now, is that right? Yeah, well... And, and Alexander Skarsgård. Yeah, well, first I'm playing a Latino migrant worker in... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah. He's recorded it on his iPhone, he's ready to show you. We're shooting it in Sandy Mount. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I, I, was, I, I just finished filming a film uh, called The Aftermath, um, set in Hamburg after the Second World War. We had with Kieran and Alex and, and Jason Clark. And it's directed by James Kent. Yeah, so that that would be eight. I, I would love like to see you play a fifty-seven-year-old Mexican man. <laughs> <laughs> Make the Sorry. call. Let me <laughs> like Eddie Murphy did it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Sorry well, for interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we look forward to seeing that. We look forward to seeing what both of you do next. In the meantime, I'm, I'm looking forward to repeat viewings of this and congratulations on a wonderful film. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much.